grace to you and peace from God our Father and from our risen Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. You may be seated. Our text for today is our appointed gospel reading, and in particular, uh, for us to meditate this, uh, this uh, day uh, is verse number four, where Jesus said, Abide in me, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, so neither can you unless you abide in me. Let us pray. These are thy words, O Lord, help us and sanctify us in the truth. Thy word is truth. Amen. This uh, particular passage of Scripture, just eight short verses in reality, is just chock full of, uh, of imagery and truth, uh, divine truth, doctrinal truth, that teaches us much about how, what it means or how it is a Christian ought to live. I was taught years ago in my homiletics class, that is a, a fancy term for saying my preaching class, that uh, as we approach the text, we need to be looking at is, and, and asking, is this a text that has to do with our justification, or is this a text that has to do with our sanctification? Because the preaching is going to be different. Our justification has to do with our salvation, our sanctification has to do with what God does to make us holy. And, and this particular text, all eight verses, is a powerful metaphor that our Lord uses to communicate to us a very powerful doctrine in non-doctrinal language. That's the part I like most of all. It's non-doctrinal language. It, the doctrinal stuff is usually pretty dense and pretty meaty, and I end up falling asleep, and not because it's boring, but it just requires a lot of work to dig through. But Jesus gives this to us in a very easy to understand fashion. You see this, it shows us in a beautiful way the power of the gospel. The power of the gospel for our sanctification. Oftentimes, People will look at the scriptures and they'll say, "That's just that's these are great words to live by." They'll say, "What does Bible stand for?" And they'll say something like, "Basic instructions before leaving Earth." And I want to choke because that is not what this is. It's not an instruction book. This is rather this is God's very word to us. This is how He speaks to us. This is how God communicates with us. And for that, we give Him thanks. And so God's word is operative. In other words, it does what it says, and it communicates, and this, this book communicates the power of the gospel in a very profound way uh, for our sanctification. That is the process of making us holy, and also deals with our Christian behavior, and it also shows how God operates for our life's goals. You see, what the essence of this, these eight verses is addressing is that remaining connected to Jesus and only remaining connected to Jesus, we do bear much fruit. Jesus said, apart from me, you can do nothing. So it is only in remaining connected to Jesus. And so it really begs the question, well, how do we know we're connected to Jesus? Well, how we know is because of this thing called grafting. We are connected to the vine. Jesus uses this beautiful imagery of, of the vine and the branches, and, uh, and we are connected to the vine. We are grafted in. And how does this work? Well, this grafting takes place using the imagery of a vineyard. When a farmer wants to grow grapes, uh, he is going to, he or she is going to look at the soil, is going to look at the climate, it's going to look at, you know, at, at all of a wide variety of many things and is going to go out and purchase a root that is very unique and specific for that particular region. What might grow well in the Napa Valley might be horrible, for example, here in the San Diego County. 
And so, so the farmer is going to pick something that is going to be perfect for their climate. And then what they will do is then they will take a varietal, whatever it is that they want to grow. They have their root stock, they put it in the ground, it's starting to grow. And uh, then they will decide on the varietal, say Cabernet Sauvignon, for example. And they will take a little bud and cut this little bud off of a branch that they have in their little toolbox and literally make a notch at the base of this varietal, of this rootstock that they've planted. Literally make a notch, a wedge, and then insert this little bud inside there. And then they tie it together with tape that resembles a, a, a band-aid until that wound heals. And then the life source of, 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 this, of this rootstock begins to pulsate through this bud that then begins to grow into a branch and then begins to produce leaves and then begins to produce fruit. And so the vines or the varietal stock is selected based on the soil, based on the climate, so that they can become resistant to the negative anomalies that are unique to that region. Likewise, you and I are grafted into Jesus Christ, the vine, because he saves us from the penalty of sin and death so that we can produce fruit that will last. And how does this grafting take, take place? Well, it takes place by faith as we go to the waters of holy baptism. St. Paul tells us that don't you know, in Romans 6, that don't you know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ have been baptized into his death and into his resurrection, and therefore we are made one. The grafting takes place. And now all we need to do is be watered and the soil cultivated and, and uh, cared for and tended by the vine dresser, by the Father himself, with the goal that we would bear fruit by abiding in Jesus and his word. Jesus said in verse 5, I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him, he bears much fruit, for apart from me you can do nothing. You can do nothing. Or as my friend would say, you can do nothing apart from me. And that is the operative word here, that apart from me, you can do nothing. Just chew on that. Just meditate on that for a bit. And that really is, is something that's somewhat stinging to us. We don't really like that in our sinful flesh because we want to think and we want to believe that God, well, after all, God has given us gifts, after all, and he has given us abilities to do certain things. He has given us a mind in which we can figure things out. But we can't unless we remain connected to Jesus. And that is the very last thing that the evil one wants. He, what, he does, what the evil one does not want is for fruit-bearing Christians to last. He, 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 in fact, he is doing things... And uh, uh, he doesn't want the, the Christian to do things that are God-pleasing at all. He does not want the fruit to be of any value that will last. And so the, the devil is going to do everything in his power to, to keep us separated from the vine, to keep us from the nourishing sap that is flowing through the vine and into the branches. He keeps us from the word of Christ, the means by which, and the only means, I want to emphasize, the only means by which Jesus communicates with us is through his word. You see, the devil tries to convince us that the word of God is not operative. The, the devil wants to convince us that this is an ancient book about two to five thousand years old, and they're just dusty words on a page. That this word cannot guide us, it cannot answer questions 
that if we, if we spend any time there, it's just an utter waste of time. So why bother? Is what the devil whispers in our ear. But rather, in fact, this is what God's word says about itself. And from Hebrews chapter 4, that the word of God is living and active. It is sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and spirit, of joints and marrow, and discerning the thoughts and the attentions of the heart. You see, dear friends, this is clearly demonstrated by the Word of God in the midst of a raging storm. You remember that story? The disciples are out on a boat, and the storm comes, and these are seasoned fishermen, but the storm had to be pretty bad because they were terrified for their life. And so the storm comes raging, and they're panicking, and then they wake up Jesus, and then comes the Word from the Lord. Peace be still. And all was quiet. The text doesn't say that, that the winds died down, that, the, that as the winds died down, the waves died down. It just said all became quiet. Just by a word that was spoken. Or another time, there were, one day there was 5,000 men plus women and children that were listening to Jesus, that were, that were being fed by the word of the Lord until, until it was getting late in the day. And what did, what did, the, what did the, the word of the Lord do? The word of the Lord gathered together five loaves of bread and two fish and fed till they were satisfied 5,000 men plus women and children. How? because of the word of the Lord. Or when by the word of Jesus, Peter was able to walk on the water, and Peter was doing fantastic, because Jesus just said, come, and so he came. And Peter was doing great, at, at least until the wind started to blow and the, wing, and the waves started to pick up, which caused Peter to stop listening to the word of the Lord, in favor of all the stuff going on around him. You see, this is the arena in which the devil tries to convince us that we don't have time to search the scriptures. We don't have time to look for God's wisdom and desire for us because we have pressing decisions and pressing matters at hand. In Bible class today, this morning, we were looking at Psalm 37, where the psalmist uh, put it like this in a very powerful way. Thank God for Carl Lieberman. Taught me to memorize the books of the Bible. Where is it? It's a different Bible I'm using. Uh -oh. oh, here we go. Verse 7, Psalm 37, verse 7. Be still in the Lord and wait patiently for him. Do not fret because of him who prospers in the way, because of the one who carries out wicked schemes, but rather wait patiently for the Lord. Just sit there. Let God do his work. And that is what Jesus is talking about when he says, abide in the vine. The devil knows that when we approach the word of God in faith, he knows that the spirit of God takes these words and works something wonderful in our hearts and stuff begins to happen. As I mentioned, the disciples thought that they were going to die when the storm came upon them. But then this word made flesh, Jesus himself simply said, peace be still. And guess what? All was still. These disciples, the very same disciples, were genuinely concerned and really concerned about the thousands upon thousands of people who came to listen to the word uh, of Jesus 
And it was late in the day and they still had a, the people still had a journey to make to get home and they were concerned that they would be fed. And so they encouraged Jesus to send them away and Jesus simply said, you feed them. Huh. And all they could gather up was five loaves of bread and two fish. And they're thinking, oh, this is not going to be enough. But the word of the Lord directed the people instead to sit down in groups. He took the bread, he took the fish, he said a prayer, he said a blessing, and then he had the disciples distribute the food. And everybody ate, thousands upon thousands of people ate, they were satisfied. And then Jesus instructed the disciples to pick up the leftovers and they picked up 12 baskets full of pieces. You see, the word made it happen. Yet when we're not immersed in the word, especially when we're in need, we're no longer able to abide in the vine. We're no longer able to receive the nutrients that the vine has to give us. Let me direct your attention to our bulletin cover because it is a beautiful image of, of what we're talking about here. The branches and the leaves and the fruit that comes cannot possibly happen unless it remains connected to the vine. And, and the way in which Jesus does this in the life of the Christian is by saying, abide in my words and my words will abide in you. You see, we should be, we should be concerned and disturbed even. When I, I was talking to uh, a Christian not long ago and encouraging them to, re, to come to church, and they said, you know, I went to church for years, now it's someone else's turn. Wow. It's like a veil is being placed over their eyes to keep them from seeing the truth, to keep them from seeing the reality of what God does in the pages of this book. What God, the prayers that God answers through his word, the guidance and the direction that he gives us. There was a book written many years ago, back in the 70s, that was entitled, God Can Make It Happen. It was a popular Christian book. In fact, I think it was even on a Christian booksellers, bestsellers list. But the, but the, the, the premise of the book was, that God can make it happen as we stay immersed in the word and connected to the vine because of that. You know, a lot of people love this uh, good old American hymn, In the Garden. Uh, I might be the only one who doesn't care for it, but, but a lot of people do. But the chorus goes something like this, and he walks with me, and he talks with me, and he tells me I am his own. And so it really begs the question, how do you think that happens? I mean, that's true. That, that course is true. But how do you think it happens? How do you think he walks with me and talks with me and tells me he is his, that we are his own? It happens through the word. What are you facing today where you wish you knew and you had have confidence and what God would have you do, that you could go to scripture and you could say, yes, I know that because of what it says here. So many times we just do what seems right in our own eyes as the prophet Jeremiah lamented. But whatever it is that we're doing that is apart from the word, we need to stop. The wind and the waves are gonna come like they did for St. Peter. And when they came, Peter failed because he let the wind and the wave distract his attention away from the word who has command over the waves. The author of Hebrews tells us in chapter 12, therefore, since we have, a, since we have so great a cloud of witnesses surrounding us, let us also lay aside every encumbrance and the sin which so easily entangles us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, fixing our eyes upon Jesus, 
the author and the perfecter of faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of God. And what is Jesus doing for you and for me as he is sitting there at the right hand of God? Hebrews also tells us in chapter 7 that he is able to save completely those who come to God through him, through the word, because he always lives to intercede for them. He is there praying for them. This is a beautiful gospel reading, and another image I just want to spend just, just five minutes on is this image of being thrown and away and cast into the fire, those that refuse to abide. Verse 6 says, If anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away as a branch and cast into the fire and are burned. And I'd like to suggest to us that the he in this text, that he is thrown away, that the he in this text is anyone who attempts to do anything apart from Jesus, the Word. That his or her faith will be like that branch severed from the vine, that he'll be cast aside and left to wither and eventually burned up. But listen to what the prophet Isaiah says, because this is where it gets exciting. The prophet Isaiah declares in chapter 11, There shall come forth a rod out of the stem of Jesse, and a branch shall grow out of its roots. Then Jeremiah records in chapter 23, Behold, the days will come, saith the Lord, that I will raise unto David a righteous branch. Both of these are talking about the promised Messiah. This branch in this passage is referring to Jesus. You see, after 33 years of, of life-bearing perfect fruit here on this earth, this branch that both Isaiah and Jeremiah talk about, this Jesus, the Word, now get this, he is attached to a tree. He is attached to a tree of the cross. After doing everything right, after doing everything perfect, he is attached to the tree of a cross. And there God, his Father, cut him off as a branch. Just completely cut him off, disowned him. He viewed his son as a branch whose fruit withered. He viewed him as a branch that dried up. Then God gathered him up and cast him into the fire, into hell itself, as Jesus cried out, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? You see, this branch was severed from his vine, his heavenly Father himself. And he did this for you. You see, he was made to be our sin and therefore was made a curse for you and for me. He was made into the fruitless branch in our place, became our substitute and suffered the fate of all fruitless branches in our place. And this is the good news of this wonderful doctrine called the substitution that the Word, the Word that made us clean, happened because of Jesus. This is the good news. This is that Word that also enables us now as branches to bear the fruit that is pleasing in God's sight. And so Jesus concludes our Gospel reading today with these words, If you abide in me, and my words abide in you, Ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. My Father is glorified by this, that you bear much fruit, and so prove yourself to be my disciples. And that's the promise that we have through abiding 
our prayers are answered, that God provides for our every need through his power, not our own, through his ingenuity, not our own. We see remaining connected to Jesus and only when remaining connected to Jesus are we enabled to bear fruit. In Jesus' name, amen. And now may the peace of God, which surpasses all human understanding, may keep our hearts and our minds in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen.